Hey guys, Seb Chuf here. This is my third episode of my monthly podcast called Realm Relapse, where we talk about the most influential people in the realm of the Mad God space. And today, for the third episode, I'm talking to Juix, who is a super interesting guy because he developed Dallas's Dominion by himself like seven to eight years ago. Also developed Trials of Titan, which was a realm alike that gained quick popularity among Realm of the Mad God content creators. Even Bikuri Box was saying how much he loved it in the last podcast and was sad to see it shut down. And it actually actually got DMCA by Decca Games, which we'll um, get into later, and now is working on his hypest game yet, a new cross-platform realm-like called Born Again, which I'm super excited for. And yeah, let's get into all of that now. Welcome, Juix. How's it going? Hello. I'm doing good. To um, kick things off, when did you start playing Realm of the Mad God? Um, I started playing Realm in 2012, and it was actually Yangu who oh, wow. introduced me to it. Really? So... Oh. Like, uh, yeah, a cool connection there. Oh, that's so cool. Because, yeah, you're both working on uh, the current Born Again with him, right? <laughs> yeah, and he helped with music and sound effects for Trials of Titan as well. Oh, wow, that's really cool. Do you guys know each other IRL or something? Yeah, he's a, he's my cousin in real life. Oh, that's awesome. So. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. I thought you might have met him like during your journey with making Realm Likes or something. <laughs> that's what I assumed. <laughs> no, we've both been, we've been playing. We played during 2012 and just kept going and... I just yeah. yeah. So when did you um stop playing Realm of the Mad God? Was that alongside when you started Dance's Dominion? Not really. I think I stopped playing Realm in twenty twelve or twenty thirteen, twenty fourteen. And from there I just kinda stopped playing the main game, was more, and was more interested in just making my own I mean I at first it was just like creating items, creating behaviors and just fun characters. Was that during Kabam time that you stopped playing Realm? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, things really slowed down then, right, with development? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When did you start working on Darsas? I started working on Darsas in the end of 2016. I could be off by a year, but that's what I remember. It was like October of 2016. I was posting on the forums about making a mobile realm, and that's kind of what kicked it off. Yeah, that's awesome. And how old were you when you started making Darsas? Um, I was 18. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty crazy <laughs> to start something um, like that so young. Yeah, I had just graduated high school, and I got a job doing software development, or iOS software development. When you were 18? Yeah, during the summer so the summer after I graduated and then I <laughs> I didn't really like it and I kept working on like this space game on on the side so then I just like stopped working there and then from there pretty much immediately went into working on Darza's oh really nice and that was completely solo right at least until it released yeah really impressive I mean the help that I had was like using or trying to understand like previous private servers which I mean for the for better or for worse <laughs> just because of how they were made I mean they're not architectured yeah or their architecture is not completely there but mm. um, that was just like looking at the source and and understanding how it all worked was and then creating my own version in Darza's is how it started. How many years ago exactly did Darza's release? It was like six, seven, eight? Uh, 2017. If my, 2017. <laughs> if I'm not still off by a year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, initially threw it up on December 17th. It was my birthday, actually, for the initial beta. Just invited a bunch of people to come play it. And uh, Realm of the Mad God was clearly a big influence for Darza. What else led to Darza's creation? Well, that's like uh, iOS development. I mean, in high school, I used to make... I made a bunch of standalone iOS games, like little tap to plays. I don't know if you ever like Flappy Bird. Oh, so that yeah. was big when I was in high school. And like that just yeah. inspired me to make a little simple game on iOS and people can play it and have fun. So I just made my own simple games and then I, I sold them to other oh, companies. Oh, really? And then just did that throughout high school. How many games did you make before Dazzle? I think I made eight or nine. I don't know if I sold them all. Wow, but I know I had, There was a company yeah. that kind of I kept kept going with and they wanted me to keep making more i just wasn't too interested in just continuing to do it for them so mm. i kind of phased out and then did my own thing but yeah they, it was fun like they would buy them for me for just a flat rate and then they would do all this yeah. marketing and it was big like vine was big back then and yeah. i would see my game being like advertised for like these big viners they'd be like oh play this ios game just because the people who bought it are now like paying them to make ads or something it was it was kind of cool was dos is the first like online game that you made massive multiplayer online yeah. Jeez. What was the biggest challenge with developing Dazas? Um, ooh, at first, just uh, understanding all 
how a multiplayer game on the back end really works. Um, Because I had a lot of, I mean, well, I had experience working on like the front end app and like the visuals and and creating sprites and all all that. But the back end was kind of what I was and and what I have been growing on over the last seven years. So definitely going or learning that and then making mistakes with just the how (laughs) how the processes all work together in in the back and because i'm sure uh, if das's dominion was a single player game it would have been like half as easy right maybe even easier <laughs> oh yeah yeah a lot easier <laughs> yeah i so i have i mean i had no i have no traditional knowledge or i mean i haven't gone to school for for programming or anything so i it's all yeah, it's just pretty impressive. trying to figure it out as as we go and like the yeah. trying to figure out the solution to the need if we can rewind a bit when did you start learning about um developing ios apps in high school, so 2013, or not 2013, 2015. I actually made uh, f- a Flash game before that. <laughs> oh, really? Just like this. Oh, wow. <laughs> Wait, how, how old were you then? Uh, that was in high school, so I was, I was 16, 16 or 17. That's pretty impressive, yeah. It was a simple Flash game, so it... Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't fun at all. Like I think I had someone review it, and they're like trying to. They, I bet they were just trying to be nice or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't yeah. anything spectacular at all, and it was like the challenges were easy. And if they were hard, it was because it was just coded bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was your fondest memory with Daz's Dominion? Um. Oh, my fondest memory. It's definitely the. I mean, it's the funnest experience to just get on and and play with a bunch of players, and then now they obviously say they recognize who i am so it's like we can make a little event and spawn yeah. <laughs> spawn things for them or spawn things that they yeah. don't normally see and it's it's fun to just interact with the players yeah that's really cool you were working on dazas for about like two years like after it released is that right until yeah 2020 is that correct or 2019 i don't remember the exact date it might have been 20 probably 2019 actually i stopped for about a year i don't know if it was a full year before I transferred the game to the current team. I don't remember the exact dates, but I'm pretty sure it's 2019. What made you step away from Darzas? There was a lot of things with Darzas. It's like the first year with Darzas release, I was actually working with one of those marketing companies that I had sold games to before, and they wanted to partner on Darzas. So I was like, okay. They promised me a bunch of big things. And I mean, I was just a naive kid, so <laughs> was hoping that they would definitely come through with everything. And it, it just did not work out. So that put a sour vibe to the first year. They wanted me to transfer, and the whole app did get, I mean, get transferred to their accounts on the app store, and then they handled everything. And then like, I was basically a developer for it. So so that sucked for me, and I didn't like that at all. Yeah, well, that's weird. So how did you gain control of it again to um, transfer it to the current devs? Well, I bought it back from them, so it was the worst, the worst deal I've ever made. I gave them, <laughs> I gave them, I think, yeah. either half of the game, like equity yeah. for free, based off yeah. of their promises, and then had to buy it back from them. So then, basically, started from square one again, uh, a year or two in, and then went from there. As for stepping away, it was just, I think, a moving on aspect. Like I haven't worked on it for a long time, and it was just kind of started, and there were a lot of architectural issues. And I, I mean, rewritten the source of two or three times, uh, and then the client rewritten it twice or written it twice because initially and then <laughs> written again. So it's more just wanted to work on different things, especially from the aspect of learning how to be a better programmer. Being stuck on one project for your whole career in a way, it really restricted me in growth. Was it playable on PC while you were a developer for Dozers or not yet? Um, not yet. I, I don't believe it was. Yeah. We were working on yeah. a new client. So I think that was the third, the third rewrite was coming in yeah. when I left. So yeah. we were trying to finish the source or the, the, the server. And then the client, that client had a PC port. But when I was on the team and when it was live, when I was on the team, I don't think it had a running PC client. That's so funny. Yeah, that's crazy. Because you said you rewrote the client three times, and then I'm pretty sure Link said he rewrote the client twice since uh, <laughs> gaining control of the game. So it's pretty obscene that uh, Decker had to do a fundraiser <laughs> to support their client. What do you think about that? I, I don't know. I didn't know they did a fundraiser. <laughs> oh, you didn't know? Uh, being a company, they I mean, they should be able to just pay for that themselves. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was doing it for free. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, after Dark 
Trollus' Dominion, you started working on a brand new mobile game called Trollus of Titan, which seemed to be like a step up from Dazas. No um, actual connection, just seemed to be an improved version in mm -hmm. a lot of aspects. It ended up releasing in 2020, is that right? Yes, yeah, yeah. around October 2020. Wow, when did you start working on it? Because it must have been like instantly, right? After you stopped working on Dazas. Yeah, there was like the hiatus, I guess, that I was already still on the Darza team, but not working on it. So there was that gap, but after the transfer, I remember because I was going on this big trip and then I did the transfer and went on the big trip. And then when I was on that trip, I started working on the initial trials code. So yeah, it was, I mean, it was immediately, pretty immediately after leaving the Darza team officially. So I only worked on it for about a year until release. The biggest difference between Darza and Realm was definitely the fact that it was on mobile. What was the biggest difference between Trials of Titan and Darza's? We're trying to do different progression. I mean, besides the Ovid, like it was themed differently, but I mean, in terms of gameplay, that doesn't doesn't change mm. much. It was still it was still permadeath. It changed the stats a little bit and changed how your ability worked. We were doing like a rage system or one that you had to build up by attacking enemies. Yeah. So the biggest, I mean, there were just some changes to the the gameplay between the two. But I mean, I, I don't think there were. I mean, they're yeah. both still pretty under the umbrella of realm in terms of realm likes and like mechanics and like gameplay loop. It was pretty much the same idea. Like you're closing a realm, doing an end game fight, and then doing that again <laughs> it didn't have stat pods i mean it had its equivalent like there were scrolls that you collected to level up your stats and whatnot and then maxing out and i mean it had a few like niche systems like um ascending and you could spend your essence which was the xp yeah i think the main thing was that you could level infinitely is that right yeah yeah the cost just uh, went up and it yeah. went up exponentially <laughs> it would take a millennia to yeah. get <laughs> some of your levels when we played with where you could just allocate the stats however you wanted to level up when you leveled up you basically accrue like these stat points and then you could decide how those are distributed and then we also played with how realm does it so you just get your stats on level up and then you do your stat maxing I'm not sure if you know this trials of titan was really popular among the realm with mad god content creators like there was for example bikuri box said he was a massive fan of it in the last podcast which surprised me but i knew that calcium was someone who made a video on it then there was um ts page and jer who also made videos on it and i'm sure there was a lot of other people that played it that i'm not aware of what do you think made trials of titans so popular so quickly because it didn't even release by that time right it's a new world like a new experience that it's got its own characters and had its own music and the world building I mean, it had a lot of fun things like the goblin quartet and the nexus and just like polish in a way that it was just like it was fun for us to work on it wasn't the, like full of content like if you compare it to the content of realm it's it's f very lacking especially on release realm at the time or realm no realm at the time i mean just had all the dungeons and yeah. i mean it just takes years to accrue that kind of content base but i mean what it did have was good for its size and it just had nice world building and and fun interactions and i think everyone also just fans of realm really yeah. like any any realm like because they're everyone's looking for yeah. a new experience to play and new mechanics to learn yeah it definitely has the same energy and i think the fact that it was on mobile played a big part in its success as well because uh even though that it's so similar to realm it basically doesn't have competition because there's nothing else on mobile that's similar yeah no, absolutely. I mean, that added to the, the success of Darza too, just being a fun mobile game. When I mean, you think mobile games, you always think of like some gotcha, like cash grab app. You could like think of Clash of Clans. Well, that's a popular mobile game, but like it's still such a cash grab. Like you can pay to win. The way you do win is to pay money. It's fun to have a game out there that's actually just a fun MMO experience, especially for mobile. Yeah, definitely. And um, with all the popularity it was gaining at the time, it definitely had a lot of eyes from it from people from Realm which includes the developers themselves. <laughs> it's crazy, but Decca actually DMCA'd Trials of Titan, is that right? Yeah, they did. Did they officially send a cease and desist? Yes. Yeah, I got so I got messages from all the app stores telling me that they had received a DMCA from Decca Games and that I needed to start working to resolve it with them. So they took down the app from the list like app store listings and then Steam wouldn't let me release or any I mean every store got hit with the DMCA. But yeah, back to the DNCA, I mean, I just immediately responded to them and I sent them my entire devlog because I have been posting on the Discord community almost every single incremental change that I made to the game. So it's like, <laughs> hey, I've got this whole thing, like I'm not using any private server source, I'm not using any assets, it's 
all just done completely new. Yeah, like no net code, no assets, no sound, no sprites. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. They took their time responding. I think it took about two weeks from the initial DMCA to getting them to remove it. Oh, so they ended up dropping it in the end. Yeah, they did. It was interesting because we had contacted them before. We we contacted them about a month earlier. Yangu had written music for the Endgame boss that kind of hinted at Realm's original music. Like he used, I'm not sure the musical terms, like motifs or like theming from just the very original realm music just to call back to the game and just the roots <laughs> and they they said then no they wouldn't be okay with that so we had to remove that piece from the final boss fight music so it's definitely on the radar i mean if they had problems with that i don't see why they didn't just tell us then that sounds eerily similar to um because the only other time that Decker's DMCA'd anything similar to Realm is at least that I know of is uh, when they DMCA'd Revenge of the Fallen. You remember the private server? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah. that only happened because one of the devs asked them for permission to use the sprites or something. Probably not the smartest move, <laughs> but um yeah, it sounded really similar to that. And I think that only happened also because uh, Revenge of the Fallen had so many eyes on it as well because so many content creators were also making videos on that game. How did the Decker DMCA affect your motivation as a developer? Um, well, I mean, it destroyed our initial release. I mean, we couldn't release anything. Like, no one could download the game at first because it, it was taken down from everything. I mean, the DMCA sucked, and it was a stressful time over those two weeks. Yeah. But we did get it resolved. And, I mean, I was certain yeah. all the way that it wouldn't stick because we didn't use anything. So it's like, I've got this whole devlog, and there's no way. I was sure they were just mistaken. Yeah. And so that's why I just emailed them the whole reasoning, and then they took it down. In terms of developing motivation, mm -hmm. I mean, there were other things things that also led i mean ultimately to the shutdown of, of trials of titan i'll get into it in a moment let me just ask because some of the reasons were pretty funny that they listed for the reason for dmca i don't think using a motif for the game wouldn't even be one of them right unless you use like the exact tune because that would be like using a similar sprite right to call back to something i know there's this other game i forgot the name but they have like a sprite really similar to oryx to call back to realm as being it's one of its influences like you could get away with using a motif Right? That's similar to your own? I think it was the melody. That, that might have been the word I was looking for. And even, I think using the melody a little bit isn't even, I'm not a copyright lawyer, so I don't know the exact, but I mean, we were just playing on the safe side to ask them and then taking it out. I mean, I don't remember their reasonings, but they, they were talking about like similar fonts and sprites. They said they were like, they were thinking it was a private server using their Flash client somehow <laughs> and making it mobile. <laughs> so they weren't even too knowledgeable on the trials of titan is that right yeah that's what it sounded like from the dmca the wording because they talked about how this is, has been a problem like they've seen a few private servers pop up and then they put in like we've never seen one on the app store <laughs> so it's like well it's because it's made by it's it's a new client yeah 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 i remember one of the reasons standing out to me was that they listed was that it had the same gameplay loop like we roam close which is uh, a <laughs> yeah a bit crazy yeah and that's i mean that in yeah. itself isn't copyright infringement to use like a mechanic in that way if you use like the same assets and use all the same wording and it's just kind of very obviously close it had the same general loop you know but the progression system was different so i mean that's just my opinion i don't think that's something that is copy like a dmca i always assume that decker just wanted to shut down the competition but i guess it makes sense if they fought you a private server because that would i think that's a fair dmca um if you were a private server but i think the negative is that they didn't really do any research into it. It's like someone at the company just saw it on a, at a glance. It's like, oh, let's send a DMCA. <laughs> and uh, I mean, that it's a serious thing to send a DMCA. So I'm I was surprised that they did it wrongly. Uh, it's like an official DMCA from their company, and it's a serious matter. After all of that got resolved, there was another big issue when it came to people cheating in Trials of Titan. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, that's why we had to shut it down. Day one, we had hackers. I'm guessing it's just from our closed betas people shared i'm pretty sure we even had hackers in closed beta yeah jesus <laughs> <laughs> and the reason that it, ha it led to the shutdown was just the architecture behind the server to be able to fix the hack like god mode and all the 
hacks and exploits that they were using. I would have to re-architecture the server, which would be basically a server rewrite at that point. Is that more difficult than a client rewrite? It would also be a partial client rewrite because I would have to redo the net code and how the client interacts with the server. So faced with that decision and then like the DMCA, just this overwhelming feeling of we didn't innovate enough on Trials of Titan to push it far enough from Realm and just not being personally satisfied at that point with what we'd done with Trials and then facing a rewrite, basically just shut it down and then immediately started on Project Ronin, which is born again. Yeah, so you were thinking about it during the later part of the development for Trials of Titan? Yeah, I mean, the idea of the shutdown with Trials was that if we're going to have to rewrite the server and architecture anyways, let's rewrite it and do it right this time. Let's innovate and play test and try and figure out a, a different way we can take a game from Realm, but still provide a fun and similar MMO experience. I mean, Born Again is Trials of Titan. Basically, it's like what we wished Trials of Titan was from the onset. With the cheats in Trials of Titan, was God Mode the worst part? Was there any like duping or anything like that? Uh, there wasn't any duping that I'm aware of. We had item IDs in Trials. The worst case scenario with duping was that you duped and then somewhere down the road one of them disappears. God mode was the biggest culprit. Cheating wasn't as much of an issue in DAWs as was it? I know that game had some duping issues. It wasn't and I think that's due because we had it on mobile and not a lot of people were basically the current realm hackers aren't weren't experienced in hacking a mobile application so I think that just deterred him and also it, it just separated itself from the hackers and that like when it first started it was I had vulnerable to the same issues so I mean that's why I'm thinking it it's, it's people just didn't want to didn't have the experience to do it at the time we had some hack like it did come up especially god mode and we put in tentative fixes i don't know where they're at currently but this was all six five or six years ago straight after trials of titan or even during you were working on born again how long were you working on born again for before the first post testing beta so the first closed testing was in may of this year so it would have been two years and a few months. We started on Born Again in November of 2020, the same year as Trials of Titan being closed. So two years, two years and a few months before our first closed session. And that's the longest that you've ever worked on a game before releasing, is that right? Yeah, I spent the first year basically working on the architecture and the back end. I created a web hosting software and system for the idea of it will host and help host Born Again. So that's just a, a generic platform that you can turn on, turn off servers, upload, upload updates to your servers, and just a lot of server management tooling. So that took like the first year. Also within that, creating like a subservice that specifically worked with multiplayer games, and that's the netcode and the backend server functionality. The first year of development on Born Again was architecting and then implementing that before even working on specifically Born Again stuff. How does a Born Again carve its own niche? What makes it differ from other bullet hell games, in your opinion? It's a bullet hell and hack and slash game. I mean, that in itself is very different from Realm, but very different from other MMOs. Every player that you're, or every class that you play is a melee class. We don't have any long range projectiles as your auto attacks. Like you're not clicking and shooting enemies and you're not always just dodging their projectiles that they shoot out. You're trying to dodge their slash attacks or their bombs or like their radio attacks it's got a lot more movement and physicality to it too in terms of like boots you can you can jump over things you can jump over obstacles and collision you can dash with a different type of boots the ability system's completely different. Basically every item in Born Again or every equipment item has an activatable ability. So every class has a weapon type that it can use and that's the weapon that it uses for its basic attack. So if you right click, you'll do your basic attack to the nearest enemy. Yeah, that was such a smart decision to make it auto aim because it would have been so tough, especially for mobile users. I don't know how they would have done it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that came about from like, we've got five abilities that we want you to aim and we don't want you aiming your <laughs> basic attack as well just get in there get close and turn on your auto fire and you'll do damage but i mean when you're close you're in danger of getting attacked so i'd rather you focus on how to use your boots to get away or 
to dodge the incoming attacks. Yeah, with the abilities are so interesting. Like there's the jumping, which is kind of like the Dark Souls role. Yeah. And there is some ranged attacks that you can use, like the abilities that have projectiles, like the shuriken and bow, but not too much that it takes away from the hack and slash. What's your favorite aspect of Born Again that will be in the game's full release? Well, me and Yang Yu are both excited for the Avatar Blessings. It's a feature that we're going to be working on here in the next two, three weeks and starting on it. But it's basically the main goal and the main modifiers that you're going to be looking for in the game. Basic layout is that you're searching for these blessings in the game and the blessings will modify your gameplay. You could have a modifier, for example, that will, I mean, every time you kill an enemy, it'll heal you. We have a whole list, but the basic idea of modifiers is that it's some sort of passive that's going to alter your gameplay. It's like a common roguelike thing where like you get a, oh, it won't be random, right? You will be able to select one or multiple. The current thinking, we haven't implemented to them so anything is subject to change through playtesting but the current thinking is you get them from avatars and each avatar has its own set of blessings that it can drop so like the first the level one avatar or the bo- first biome avatar has like kind of lower level blessings but you'll have nine slots for your blessings so you want to get one from each avatar so you can get all nine eventually at the same time or can you only like select one you can have one for each slot so one from each avatar but an avatar can drop any blessing from its pool so if you don't like the one you got from an avatar you can kill it again and and try and get a different one. Oh, so each one is multiple yeah and again i mean we haven't play tested it because the the whole system is still in queue to be worked on so it's all just our me and yangu talking about it and trying to think of what's going to be fun so that i mean that's our plan i think my favorite aspect of the game is definitely the iframes you get on jumping so much fun you get it from the firecrackers as well right yeah you get it from a lot of mainly the the agility items I mean, we've got the abilities all organized into different styles so there's four there's power Power, agility, finesse, and focus. And each each style is focused on a different niche. Like finesse is really about like the samurai's play style. Like you're dodging and dashing. Agility is more jumping over things and whatnot. It's like the boots are agility, firecrackers are agility. There's the tessin, which is like a backwards agility item. Um, I don't think that one actually jumps. You just dash backwards. The second biome version of it, you do jump backwards though, if I recall. But those work with the, the class passive. So the difference in classes like i said the samurai has a passive so every time i use a a finesse ability when i'm playing the samurai i get a speedy status effect and then each each class has its own passive like the i mean the shaolin i mean you jump in you get armored that one's off of any agility assassin it's off of any agility you get fury which is just attacking faster well uh, also planning on using these styles in a way with the blessings that you can try and use the blessings and the styles to create what you like to play with or a play style that you you are enjoying like you can mix maybe you're playing like a, an assassin and you, your main is going to be agility because that's the class class's main style but maybe you collect blessings that have like a power passive so now you also can use a power ability and, and gain benefits from it before the full release there's going to be a hardcore mode is that right the way i want to do it or the way i'm thinking right now is letting you select like a birth blessing so the default birth blessing is that when you die you save your levels and you're not going to lose your level is not going to be permadeath but you can unlock and select different birth blessings that are going to change up how you progress your character so for hardcore an example of that one is maybe you you get two times xp but you're also forfeiting the other blessing of saving your levels when you die so you're losing everything yeah like the permanent progression man if um this game gets a ppe mode before realm of the mad god that'd be so crazy <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i'm really excited for that that's probably my most anticipated feature in the game what's been the toughest aspect of developing the game so far working on the overworld has been the biggest feature and thing to work on we've been working on all the enemies environment basically everything you see in the overworld the whole design aspect of it we've been working on that since the beginning of this year so january december and we've been I mean, working on it just straight from there and it's uh, we're we're almost done <laughs> there's a light at the end of the tunnel but it's it's been it's been a hard process just going back and playing things and just making i mean this whole week i've been going back through and play testing all the every single enemy and trying to mix them up in ways that are more fun for the player it's more of a quantity thing is that right like not really difficulty in coding 
Yeah, there's just a lot to do in terms of doing the whole overworld. You've got to do it in a way that it's the content is really different and, and fun different. I mean, I could make a bunch of enemies, but if they all attack the same, it's going to be a bit boring to play. So yeah, doing it in a way that's that feels like the enemies all have their own personalities and that the areas feel really unique and playable and like they're they're really a part of the world is the hard part and just doing that for all nine biomes takes takes a lot of time <laughs> so it's been gru- grueling yeah i could definitely imagine but it's pretty impressive what you guys have achieved for a two-man team so far does yangu help with the overworld or does he just do music and sprites i think it's music and sprites right yeah so yangu has stepped up in born again on trials of titan he was just working on music and sound effects but for born again he's been working on environment art music and sound effects as well and design so just helping a lot with the spriting so it's been nice to have that and you can definitely see if you compare trials of titan and its design compared to born again you could directly see the comparison and, and how much more beautiful <laughs> born again looks compared yeah definitely i love the look so much and the sound effects are so awesome as well even with the biomes and the overworld there's still going to be like dungeons in born again is that right we plan on having dungeons we don't know what they're going to look like because we're really just focusing on making the overworld and game like overworld loop uh playable and fun and we want to take dungeons in a way that feels like they're their own experience so it's not a release feature but maybe a year after release we'll have enough dungeons in that it feels like they're filling in a a need in the game even the overworld will feel like a lot are you planning to have unique items from all of the boss type enemies in born again yeah that's that's the release minimum so we want unique items to drop from every encounter so an encounter are just like the area bosses there's typically three in every biome um, and then killing those is what spawns the avatar of a biome so getting unique items onto all those is going to be our first step Um, how filled out the items feel like if we still feel like we can make a bunch of items and they still feel unique and it's like we're not just making them just to make them but like we have a reason for making them we would also like to expand it to a unique item in every camp oh wow awesome oh what would a camp be exactly the way we have it structured in the overworld is that there's a camp and a camp spawns like minions of itself and it has itself so in the first area you can see there's the kobukin brute they have names in their level next to them if they're a camp so i mean that's the first indicator but those they're the things that constantly respawn in the world you got the encounters on top of that and then the avatars on on top of that and then i mean there's other random encounters like uh moment in the mountains he just does his he's kind of on his own respawn timer but those are like a a random encounter that we want to add we haven't been working on those specific archetypes too much yet but those are more just for fun like if we have a fun random idea to add to the game we'll throw it in there as a random encounter there's a day and night system in born again is that right yes it's currently it's just visual it just changes the look of the world it just looks dark (laughs) you can see the lights and everywhere i mean it looks atmospheric like you you can feel like you're in a real lighted area and world. Um, Do you have any plans to um, make it beyond just appearance? We don't have any specific plans at the moment, but it's it's not out of the question. A simple thing to do would be to have different or certain camps or random encounters spawn only at night or day. We'd really have to get together and just brainstorm ideas that would that would be fun and ways to make a day and night system and different account like different interactions with that feel like it's actually <laughs> worth it and that we're not just doing it just to say we have different interactions at night and different interactions at day like it has to really work within the game system so until we're comfortable with the solution it, it's just going to stay visual and what about open beta do you have any vague plans for when that would be so our plan is to do a month of polish work. So going back through and first fixing out any bugs that came up in the closed alpha, basically going back through and polishing up areas we feel like were left or that need it or adding things that we just think are fun or that need to be added. So that whole month, it doesn't have too much plan to it. Just basically the idea of getting it to where we feel like it's ready. We're looking at sometime in September at the moment. Oh, awesome, awesome. And what about a full release? When do you uh, roughly expect that to happen? With the open beta, we're thinking the current plan is um, to do one week of open beta and then decide where we go from there, either immediately into production release or take it down for a week and work on whatever needs to be worked on. It really depends. The open beta is really just to test the capabilities of the server and if it can handle all the players playing and to basically bug find anything. So if there's no problems, then it's all 
all good, then we can release pretty soon after the open beta. Yeah, I assume you're going to have many different servers containing the same map, is that right? Yeah. Uh, are you talking like regional servers? Like um... Yeah, yeah, regional servers. But um, I was just wondering like how many, because uh, I assume there's a limit of players that you'd want to have on a set map, is that right? Yeah, similarly structured to Realm yeah. <laughs> and, and other Realm likes in that, that you, there's the lobby in Realm, it's the Nexus, but there's a lobby area that you can, yeah. that's the hub world, that then you go and find the um the overworlds that you yeah. can join i don't know the exact like player cap that i'm gonna set likely a lot i mean <laughs> at 50 feels like a, a low amount and 75 feels like a lot or just right and then 100 feels like a lot so it's it, yeah. it'll see but in born again the game's a lot more spread out than it is in realm where everyone doesn't just congregate at the end you're more just playing through the whole biomes and then when you get to the end we're gonna have a sacrificing system so you're restarting anyways so you're not just sitting at level 80 and farming for your whole life i'm trying to remember with the sacrifice system and the leveling system if you sacrifice won't your levels be permanent anyway or will hardcore be like a very staple game mode so the sacrificing system we don't have a lot of the exact details of that pinned down but in some way it's going to take into account the levels you've earned when you sacrifice yeah. and also the blessings that you have and the point of sacrificing is to gain a permanent blessing so with a permanent blessing yeah. it's just permanently on your your character's lineage um, um, that way, yeah. if you're playing hardcore and you die, you're, you're going to always have that blessing on a certain class. So if you play a new class, you're not going to have it. But the permanent character progression is all through the blessings you gain by sacrificing and stacking those. That's about the gist of the idea that we have crafted so far for it. Two um, really important questions that I completely forgot to include. First one being, do you think cheating will be a issue in Born Again? I'm sure the uh, experience that you had with Darzas and Trials of Titan will help a lot with that. I don't think so. I've been trying, I mean, I've tried to think of all the ways you can cheat. And if you're coming from realm terms, I mean, auto nexusing, there's a there's a one yeah. second delay to nexusing in Born Again. If you're trying to escape, you have to wait a whole second and you have to yeah. basically c control your character over that second or else like so you're still vulnerable to dying the problem with auto nexusing on realm is you could just disconnect the client even if the the hacked client has like basically the hacked client can see a little bit into the future and it if it determines you're about to die it'll just disconnect you and not tell the server that you were hit or anything so basically you, you can't die which is bad from a game design perspective so we've tried to curb that with the one second delay the problem is if you disconnect you have no control of your character for that one second so if if you're in the worst situation if you have five health and you lag out and a bullet was coming right at your character the server will probably kill your character yeah i mean it's unfortunate but i think it's the better of two evils i know games like diablo and stuff have that but if you could disconnect a hardcore character like by alter fouring or something that would be a bit um crazy that brings me to my second question that i forgot to mention so in daz's dominion the monetization was really similar to realm like you could buy backpacks and xp boosters i think and there was also cosmetic options i'm not sure about the monetization in trials of titan but i believe that was similar right like backpacks and that sort of thing really similar to realm yeah you could buy backpacks the backpack was a pet your your pet was like your storage unit and it would follow you around and you just interact with it like a chest you could buy a few like quality of life things like your character slots and your your vault slots but it was the same monetization model as as realm basically and how do you plan uh, to monetize born again is it going to be the same as Darza's and trials of titan or really different we're actually switching it up this time so i want to try and do a subscription yeah. model we're thinking a $10 subscription every month. We're not clear on the exact benefits or the free to play restrictions, but basically the idea is that we're trying to just work with the player. And it seems like the most fair model and non-exploitive model from a player's perspective with a, a subscription, you're just paying $10 and that's the max that you can pay out of pocket to gain benefits in the game. And that just pays, basically that pays us to just keep making the game content and new content. And that we're not so focused on creating a batch of new cosmetics every month we still plan on having cosmetics and doing that through in-game gold that you can earn and you can just buy your cosmetics and also maybe some earnable cosmetics basically ones that show your your achievements in the game they'll sell for in-game gold the cosmetics we have right now planned are hats so you can buy different hats just through an in-game shop yeah yeah oh really cool do you plan to sell cosmetics as well 
I just see the, especially just working with it and then with just watching other games, like over the course of 10 years, just creating so many cosmetics that it feels like none of the cosmetics really mean anything anymore. And you always have to like do this cosmetic creep in that they just always have to be better and cooler in some way. I'd like to slow down on the cosmetic creation and just create what works in the game. And that way, over the course of five or 10 years, it doesn't feel like the game is now bloated with a billion different things. That's really interesting you say that because Realm of the Mad God definitely has that going on right now. Like you, sometimes you can't even tell what class someone's playing because of the skins. Yeah, the skins in Realm just can change your character into anything, just the exact sprite. Well, Born Again is different in that your character is composed of these different components. So like you have the character head and then your armor and the, the, what you look like, it's more like RuneScape in that. That way where you view like a player who's wearing certain armor it shows on their character same with the weapon same with the hat i mean the hat might work differently in that you don't physically equip it into your equips but class differentiation we plan on it doing it and how they're holding the weapons so for example the warrior holds its weapon kind of on the ground in a way like it's dragging it on the side i don't know if you can visualize that right now but that's how it is but we can make like a sword class that holds sword on their shoulder and that will create the the class distinction that way the cosmetics won't interfere with the readability of what a class is so i assume runescape's a big inspiration for born again is that right <laughs> sort of in that way <laughs> the visuals and the monetization are both quite similar yeah definitely i mean the monetization does come a little bit from that because i'm looking at games that have really succeeded over 10 i mean runescape's 20 some 20 years almost maybe yeah runescape's definitely doing one of the best and it's extremely ethical as well compared to the other ones doing well i think yeah so i, I want to implement a monetization model that's going to work over a, a long period of time and really just provide us with a job the whole time that we can just continue to work on the game because a problem i mean looking at trials of titan especially its initial release had income coming in and revenue and then basically the next month it had almost nothing having just these spurts or like pushing out a cosmetic drop and having a spur of income and then waiting on your next cosmetic drop. In my mind, that's not what I want to be working on month to month. I'd rather work on new game content. So a subscription model is, is just that, like you're paying for us to create the new gameplay and new experiences in the game rather than new ways to look. And it's really awesome that you're keeping the cosmetics not pay to win because even cosmetics can be a sense of achievement. It's kind of similar to buying gear, except it's not stats. Instead, it's like a show of the progression you made. I, I I love that aspect. Going back to gold, do you plan to sell gold for real money at all? No, we haven't thought of that at all. Trying to just keep it at just pay for the membership and then the membership will enable you to play the full game. I, I think if you could buy gold, it would break things. You can buy weapons and stuff from the, the bio merchants. So if you could gain that gold by purchasing for it, it, it would break the game's value i guess i like wearing something in it and it has meaning to it like you have good armor it's because you've played and you've put in the time to get that good armor and not because you've paid for it especially in an mmo I mean, if you look at like league of legends it makes more sense to have a skin system just the gameplay i think supports that a little bit better but in an mmo especially looking at runescape and trying to model the monetization similarly i feel like it works better yeah and even the achievable cosmetics in league of legends like the paying aspect doesn't in to feel of that at all for example um with the borders if you get like challenger in a season you have like a border but there's no like paying alternative for that i think my biggest or the inspiration i guess for a lot of achievables is like your runescape skill capes <laughs> when, i mean when i was a kid i played runescape in like 2007 <laughs> So, I mean, that's my experience from it. I haven't played really since. But it was fun when I was a kid, and I, I liked all that. And those things are really cool to me. So. so I'll definitely have your Discord down below in the description for people that want to track the progress of Born Again and for when it's getting its full release. So currently in our Discord, we have server subscriptions that you can sign up for to be able to gain access to the next closed alpha. But we have three different tiers. You can sign up for the, the lowest one, which is just $20. That yeah. will just give you access to the last closed session. Then we have a 30 dollar one that gives you and any one friend that you want to invite and then a 40 dollar tier that gives you and any two friends you want to invite into the closed alpha i mean the main reason for that is that's just that funding goes straight into yeah. born again me and yang you have an office that we work in so basically over the last seven months we've been paying for an office that's been nice to just have an area to just work in and yeah. the server descriptions have actually been able to cover that pretty much exactly every month that's been the main benefit but also the closed alpha every time we run a session 
session, it costs about $100 mm-hmm. to do that week of running. The money put towards, if someone was to buy one of the subscriptions for the closed testing, it somehow translates to in-game, like when the full release happens. Yeah, how does that work? So the exact dollar amount that you're donating, you're basically pre-purchasing membership. So it's going to get credited exactly to in-game subscription. So we plan on $10 a month for the in-game subscription. So if you're buying the $20 subscription, that's going to give you two months on release of yeah. just already paid for subscription. I guess a, a thing I should mention on the subscriptions yeah. is we have them as subscriptions and renewable. And some people have kept them like, just because they want to support the game. But for closed alpha, you don't need to keep the subscription. Yeah. You could just subscribe once and then cancel it. And you're not going to lose access to the closed alpha at all. Awesome. And that subscription is through Discord, is that right? Yeah. There was something along the lines like if you spent money on Born Again or something... Is that redeemable somehow? Oh, you're talking about Trials of Titan. Oh, sorry, Trials of Titan. <laughs> My bad. Yeah, I mean, if you purchased any anything, if you spent money on Trials of Titan, you can redeem that on Born Again. Awesome. Was there anything else you'd like to say to the fans of Born Again? Just that we're so, I mean, especially just as we get closer, we're so excited to get people playing. And as the systems have come together just continually, it's just yeah, been definitely. more and more fun to play. and. Me and Yang Yu Volt just are ready for release and we're just a few months away at this point. Yeah, awesome. Well, I'm so excited for it. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me and it's it's fun to talk about what I've been working on and, and uh, what we're excited for. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast. Next time we have Akalos on, who is currently the community manager for Deco. As long as they don't hate me too much for talking about the mistake of the DMCA in this podcast, but he will basically be representing Deco. So if you have any questions for them put them in the comments below or in my discord and there's a good chance i'll ask them make sure you chuck a like on the video and subscribe and thank you so so much to my patrons for keeping the podcast alive and i'll catch you next time peace